Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Angron. I, I am going to be a Stormy Flame. I need to fight whole armies alone. I have 10 hearts, I have 100 arms. I feel too strong to war with mortals. Bring me giants. I was born in blood, raised in darkness and I shall die free. I think, when one has been angry for a very long time one gets used to it. And it becomes comfortable, like, like old leather. And finally, it becomes so familiar that one can't ever remember feeling any other way. His name is Angron. A. K. A. The Red Angel, the Slave of Nuceria, Lord of the Red Sands, the Eater of Worlds, the Gladiator King, the Prince of Blood, Broken One if you're Argle Tal, Angry Ron, Forty Kratos, Shithead if you're Sergeant Gart, the Walking Abortion if you are Major Kill that Goddamn Retard if you Lemon Russ. Come on, do we really have to spell it out? While his name may be as clearly a play on the word anger, it is possible that his name is based on the Greek word agrin which means wild or even agron, the Gallic word for slaughter, which pretty much suits him considering he's the angriest, wildest, motherfucking motherfucker in a long and extensive history of bipedal motherfuckers. Also, if you spell his name backwards it's Norna, which is to count for something. Apparently the inspiration for his name was a corruption of the nickname a bouncer in Nottingham has, Angry Ron. What we're trying to say is, Angron just might be the angriest and the most talented and manly face to face fighting son of a bitch in the galaxy. In fact, one time he was so angry about being angry all the time, that the part of him that made him angry exploded in his head, rendering him permanently angry, and also sexually impotent, but don't let him know that. And then there was that time he was kidnapped by the Emperor, which didn't help his temper much, and gave him an excuse to fucking rage at his dad by joining up with Korn, Warhammer's god of battle, war and rage. Angron just so happens to be Primarch of the World Eaters and that swell guy. His revered exploits include slaughtering the entire population of a planet within a night, killing an entire contingent of elder warriors led by a farseer when he was only a child and leading a gladiator rebellion against their slavers and slaughtering 25 other armies sent against them, non-stop, until a huge one made up of 7 armies came and fucked their shit up against a dirty rock proving that a 7 nation army could hold him back. The emperor saved him from dying there, but left all his buddies to die, which was a tremendous blow to his martial pride and among other things, eventually led him to roar rage furiously against the emperor, believing him a coward devoid of honor. Angron went on to become one of the first Primarchs to side with Horus during the heresy, and was turned into a monstrous, frothing demon prince by his brother Lorga. Eventually, Angron joined up with Khorne, the aforementioned god of war, murder, killing, bloodshed, weeping buttholes, battle and rage. Early life. Angron has good reason to be ever so slightly miffed, his early life was one big bowl of shit after another. First he crash landed on his new home world, because Korn didn't give him a soft landing, and had a good chunk of his head torn off in the crash, after which he got jumped by the aforementioned elder, then, tired from the killing and the massive brain trauma, keep in mind he was like 6 hours old, got captured and sold into slavery by people with near imperial level technology before making him fight as a gladiator for their entertainment. He also appears to have been either the least intelligent of his brother, or else that head injury he took while crashing did a number on his intellect, as he attempted to escape numerous times even before his implantation with the nails but somehow was recaptured each time by the slavers. Who were just baseline humans with no outstanding tech, aside from a few odds and ends like the nails. Also keep in mind that more than a few of these attempts occurred when he was fully mature, and thus should have been leagues beyond what even a custodes would be capable of in terms of physical and mental prowess. The fact that he somehow managed to fail in repeatedly attempting to escape a bunch of baseline humans is actually far more unbelievable than if he had succeeded. A later retcon revealed he was a decent guy who loved his fellow gladiators, but after an incident where he refused to kill his adoptive father in the arenas, his masters proceeded to replace part of his brain with archaeotech shit, 
Originally this happened before he fully grew up. That drove him so mad that he murdered his dad regardless. Cueing a massive bout of despair. The stuff they stuck in his hood would later be called the butcher's nails. And, though never fully understood, even after the Emperor's best text took a look. They constantly applied pain to his brain and made it so the only time he could feel anything resembling happiness was while murdering shit. It should also be noted that they go from excruciating to normal, and do not deal with the pleasure centers of the brain. In other words, this pertains to actual negative reinforcement in classical conditioning. After years of being a slave, fighting through the gladiator pits and becoming the best of them, Angren eventually set up and led a rebellion fighting to free his brother and sister gladiators. This would make him 40k's answer to Spartacus, the same way Kurz is 40k Batman. He and the gladiators terrorized the planet's population for a while, burning down cities and generally making a mess of things. However, due undoubtedly in no small part to the nails, and the high probability that Angren was a bit of an idiot anyway, he didn't attack the Nusirian ruling classes with anything approaching a coherent strategy. There was seemingly no plan, only wanton destruction. As a result, the rulers of the various parts of the planet sent their militaries to gang up on Angren's comparatively ragtag group of about 2000 and after a few years, Angren's force had been reduced to half and was surrounded by at least 7 full scale armies. So he and his buddies were completely screwed, making Angren the only Primarch who failed to conquer his home planet. Something that his legion would end up being more than a little embarrassed by. Around that time, the Emperor showed up, and hashed out a deal with the local planetary government in order to expedite Angren's capture and win over the planet without any further bloodshed, because there was no point in the Emperor helping his son win a, totally justified, war against a population that had already submitted to compliance. Of course, this deal required the Emperor to take Angren away from the only people who weren't shitty to him and leaving them all to die, but Biggie didn't give a rat's ass about those fuckers, and they were all summarily executed, as you would expect in a slave rebellion. Naturally, he didn't tell Angren any of this, because he couldn't give less of a shit Aaron Dembski Bowden wanted to make the Emperor look like an ass again. Daddy issues don't make for bad writing by themselves, but said good writing is harder to write without nuance and depth. Of course, the Emperor could have saved them all or simply kill the local slavers who were, despite compliance, flying in the face of the law of the Great Crusade, give Angren the planet as a recruiting world and take the slaves to his ship to be made into a loyal ass wrecking rapper train of awesome alongside all the Terran legionnaires. Boo hoo we need our dose of our edgy grimdock here, right? So long story short. The Emperor told Angren he was coming along on the Great Crusade, Angren told him that he would rather die alongside his fellow gladiators, and the Emperor beamed him up onto his ship and left all the other gladiators to die. On the ship, Angren completely lost his shit and started attacking everything around him, managing to kill one of the custodes before Big E force gripped him into submission and basically told him to get over himself, ADB, seriously fuck you. After this. Anglin was apparently taken back to Terra to be examined by the Emperor and his best tech adepts in the hope of finding a way to fix Anglin's mutilated brain. Back on Terra, the Big E summoned Arkin Land to his labs and showed Anglin spread out with his skull hacked open and brain exposed on a surgery table, taking a good look at Anglin's fucked up skull and decided that he was a waste of time and effort, and arrived at the conclusion that even trying to remove them would likely kill him. Reference Betrayer. The Mechanicus estimated that he wouldn't live long enough to see the end of the Great Crusade. It is during this procedure that it is revealed just how completely the nails destroyed Angron, and how thoroughly tortured he would be for the rest of his existence. According to the Emperor in conversation with Arkhan. With the alterations made to the limbic lobe and insular cortex, the surgeons have impaired the twelfth's ability to regulate any emotion at all. Furthermore, they have retreated its capacity to take pleasure in anything but the sensation of anger. They are the only chemicals and electrical signals that flow freely through, and from, its brain. All else is either dulled to nothingness or rewired to inspire a supreme degree of agony. It is a testament to the durability of my Primark project that the Twelfth has managed to survive this long. His own emotions cause him pain? No, Arkan. Everything. Everything causes it pain. Thinking. Feeling. Breathing. 
the only respite it has is in the rewired neurological pleasure it receives from the chemicals of anger and aggression. Ah and it gets worse. The Emperor then reveals a few moments later that Anglin's limbic and insular lobes had been straight up removed and replaced with parts of the nails. This essentially meant that Anglin would not have been capable of feeling empathy or compassion, and it would have completely restructured his ability to link behaviors to outcomes, i.e. this behavior makes me feel good versus this behavior makes me feel bad. Even his sense of self-awareness and IQ would have been affected, which would go far in explaining quite a lot of straight up retarded crap he would go on to do. So essentially the slave masters of New Syria took away his compassion, his empathy, his emotional control, his intelligence, and his ability to learn or feel anything pleasant outside of aggression. Oh, and left him in constant agony whenever he wasn't angry. Scratch the emperor being a dick for not removing the nails, he was more of a dick for not just putting Angron down then and there, though the fact he refers to Angron only as 12th and it is shown the Emperor is not too hot on compassion, at least as far as Anglin seems to be concerned. The most tragic part of it all was that apparently Anglin was quite the broad hair primark before the nails were implanted. He even had the ability to empathically soothe the pain of others by taking it upon himself, almost certainly some latent cyclic ability, and he very often did just that for his fellow slaves. So on top of everything else, the nails completely destroyed Angren's personality, taking him from a potentially Vulcan level nice guy and lowering him to perturabo levels of barbarity. To top it all off, the nails had been designed for use on baseline humans. As a primark. Angren's brain was not only far more complex than that of an ordinary human, but had the capacity for whole-scale regeneration. This would only cause him more problems however, as the damaged or missing parts of his brain attempted to regenerate around the nails. It was believed that this process would eventually cause him to lose all ability to control himself, and that he would become little more than a rabid animal as some of his legionaries would later demonstrate. At that point, Iz was almost certain that he would manage to get himself killed in one way or another. Considering that later during the Horus Heresy, many Skeliston of the Thousand Sons was fairly certain that their sycamedics could figure out how to remove them from a certain swell guy, it is possible that the Emperor, being the most intelligent person in the Imperium and the most powerful sicker ever, could have achieved it if he put some resources into it, especially since at least one Admech replaced everything including his brain with machine parts, or it's equally likely the Thousand Sun Space Marine was just stalling because he had an insane psycho killer moments away from killing him breathing down his neck. It is however, far more likely that the nails implanted into the World Eaters were not so difficult to remove that Angren's would have been. Entire vital parts of Angren's brain had been removed and replaced with the crude cybernetics of the nails, whereas the World Eater's nails were knockoffs which were simply added onto their existing brain tissue. Because of Angren's brain being a half-cybernetic mess, both the Emperor and Arkan believed that the nails were, ironically, the only reason Angren was still alive. If they were removed, Angren's brain would likely have simply ceased to function. Additionally, attempting to replace parts of a Primarch is almost certainly a borderline impossible task, particularly if that part is a brain. The Primarchs were not just flesh and blood, but creatures of the warp incarnated by the Emperor's Genocraft. Whatever the Emperor did to create them, he clearly could not just do it on a whim as he could with Custodes or Astartes. There were only ever 20, 21 of them and even when two were erased from history mid-crusade, they were not replaced. The Emperor also never seemed to consider the possibility of making more of them after the initial scattering when they were presumed dead, despite the massive blow that killing all 20 Primarchs would have dealt to his plans. Regardless however, Arkham described the Emperor as being inhumanly toneless when speaking of Angron, and as being passionlessly interested in the surgical nightmare that Angron had become. Whether this is due to him genuinely not caring or simply being too far beyond Arkham for his attitude to be understood properly is up for debate. Rather strangely, the Emperor appeared to have been unusually callous when it came to Angron in particular, as even Primarchs like Conrad Kurz, Percherabo and Mortorian were shown at least some level of love and interest from him. However Angron, for whatever reason, was disregarded almost entirely. Regarding this anomaly, it is worth noting that Anglin was the only Primarch who did not end up ruling his native planet. 
The other Primarchs either conquered theirs or used their charisma and intelligence to work their way up the hierarchy of whatever planet they landed on, or both. Angren failed to do either, and was on the verge of being slaughtered along with his army when the Emperor came for him. Perhaps this failure is why the Emperor seemed so uniquely disinterested in him. As it is, the Emperor was told that Angren would likely not see the, the end of the Crusade, and thus took the dumbest option available to him. Do nothing to mitigate the effects, do nothing to change how much Angren hated him, and throw him into war zones after giving him a massive force and assume that it would never come back to haunt him. Could he have saved Angren? Perhaps, should he have the occasion to put his entire undivided attention to it. But with him busy with the demands of the Imperium, powering the Astronomicon and trying to get the human webway online the Emperor seemingly did not want to sink the extra time and resources into saving one of his Primarchs. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Great Crusade. You kept that mule core Farron. Russ kept his kin friends. The lion kept Luther. Humans, brothers and foster fathers, saved and raised into legion ranks. But not me. Not Angron. No. Did the Emperor teleport his gold wrapped custodians down to help me and my army? No. Did he free the warhounds and order them to battle, fight alongside me? No. Did he save my brothers and sisters the way he spared the lion's closest kin? No. No, and no. No mercy for Angren. Angren the Oathbreaker. Angren the Betrayer. Either way, when Angren was introduced to his legion he was inconsolable. He ended up hacking apart the legion captains until Ken, who was actually much further down the list of command, having risen up the ladder thanks to several of his superiors untimely ends, managed to talk some sense into his father. Though bearing in mind the Emperor had already let Perturabo dispassionately decimate 10% of an entire legion, Angron killing some captains in an emotional meltdown is small potatoes. Anyway, Khan successfully talks some sense into him, and Angron renamed his legion World Eaters, a name you might recognize translates to fucking savage in the common tongue. Anglin's old army of gladiators whom he'd led to freedom and been denied death alongside them was known as the Eaters of Cities on Euseria. So, as Brika, a Terran-born Warhounds legionary who served as captain of the Legion's 9th company, described it, from then on, they would no longer be the Warhounds, but Angren's Eaters of Worlds. Angren then replicated the Butcher's Nails technology on his legionaries. Despite the MP's warnings and how much he hated the source of the nails, his old masters, which adds a little hypocritical spice to his complaints about how the nails ruined his life, given that he did the same thing to other people for no fucking reason when given the chance. Perhaps Anglin wanted his sons to feel the same pain he experienced since he would never be able to remove the goddamn thing from his brain and it pissed him off that his own flesh and blood did not suffer as he did. More likely he was desperately trying to emulate his blood brothers and sisters in the pit since they were the only ones to give a shit, plus Lorga. Even in spite of being the first legionary to jit some, that swell guy became Anglin's cool-headed equerry. Ironic. The nails also negatively interacted with sickers, killing librarians who tried to get them installed, blowing holes in spaceships and taking down entire squads of space marines in the process as their altered brain chemistry made it impossible for them to control their abilities anymore. Also merely being near a sicker made other legionaries feel uncomfortable, described as ticking by Khan. Angren personally took this to 11, hating sickers for the additional pain they brought with the strange exception of Logger and the Emperor, who seemed not to trigger that effect. Still, the whole Butcher's Nails thing is actually quite tragic, could the fact that even being sick has caused pain to everyone implanted with the nails indicate that they were not just architecture, but technology corrupted by Korn who hates sickers? 
And even the demon Primarch still has them implanted. All the implications. In Betrayer Argyl Tal asks Khan why the World Eaters allowed themselves to be mutilated so, to which Khan replies that they thought it would bring them closer to their father. Argyl Tal continues asking if it worked, and Khan sadly mutters to himself no, it didn't. So, before Erebus made sure that Khan would become the Rage train we know in 40k by killing Argyl Tal, in the same novel, because, as Erebus put it, his damned humanity would have spared Khan this fate, because becoming a berserk psychopathic killer is so much more awesome than staying sane, he appears to be regretting this decision, at least at this point. During the Great Crusade, the World Eaters were known as the Imperium's Butcher Force. Their arrival or even just the threat of their arrival in a system was enough to make non-compliant Imperial World surrender, lest they be completely and utterly be butchered by the Red Angel and his sons, which only made it easier for the World Eaters to butcher them. They were typically unleashed in situations where the Imperium really didn't care about collateral damage. For where the Space Wolves and Dark Angels, the other two extermination legions of the Imperium, could be controlled, the World Eaters simply could not be. Angron ordered his sons to complete every single conquest and compliance action in 31 hours, since he and his gladiator army had once destroyed an entire city on Nuceria in the same span of time. When and if they failed, he mocked them for being inadequate and ordered them to decimate themselves, it apparently not having occurred to him that it's a little harder to take down an entire planet than it is one city, even if you are a space marine legion. Remember, not the brightest of his brothers. Things were getting so bad that some of the World Eaters senior officers were considering going to the Emperor for help, at least until the nails became a thing and they stopped caring about anything beyond R.I.P. and tear. One of them even talked back to Angron on the subject, which caused him to reek the fuck out and start killing his own sons again until some of the librarians knocked him out. He also had a run-in with Lemon Russ at some point, just after the Zi Legion started getting their brains nailed. Russ came to Angron after having heard reports that the World Eaters were increasingly just bathing in blood, instead of bringing worlds to compliance. Angron wasn't as brain damaged as he would be later, so he asked if Russ had come on order of the Emperor. Russ grudgingly had to admit he wasn't, this wasn't an execution ordered by the Emperor, yet, and he privately didn't want it to become one in the future. So he went on saying that implanting Angron's legionaries with the nails had to stop and that they'd be brought to Terra so a way of removing them could be devised, so he basically told Angron to sort his shit out and stop mutilating his sons. But we all know how good Russ is with people and generally just liked throwing his weight around. In more seriousness, this is one of the cases where Russ really, genuinely wanted to help one of his brothers, having had his own bouts with irresistible murderous intent to deal with. Additionally, it is heavily implied that the two missing Primarchs met their end at Russ's hands on orders from the Emperor. Russ was not a fan of his role as being the Emperor's personal judge dread as would later be demonstrated by the fact that he pleaded Lorgo's case, of all people, to the Emperor when he was considering 86 eyeing the word bearers. Russ's approach sadly wasn't well thought out. Though to be fair Angron wasn't exactly diplomatic either, telling Russ that the nails were the only thing that kept him going. That the Emperor was just another slaver, and that bringing compliance to worlds was just a way of candor coating enslaving worlds which Millie had wished to be left alone, and that without a nails he might go to big. Ian chopped the slaving bastard's head off. Ironically enough Angron had a solid point with the former argument, but the very suggestion of turning against Ems basically made Russ lose what remained of his cool on the spot with the result one would expect. There was a brief skirmish between the two legions. An event which would come to be known as the Night of the Wolf, where Anglin fought Lemon Russ in personal combat. He made him his personal bitch until he was outmaneuvered by the Space Wolves troops and surrounded, isolated from his world eaters who were just like their father putting up one hell of a fight and hurt on the wolves but being slowly separated and isolated from each other. Russ then tried to make his point a second time, that Angron's berserker rage made him and his legion lose sight of the larger tactical and strategic objectives and that Russ had deliberately lured him into a position where he could be gunned down with a snap of Russ fingers. Angron refused to acknowledge his losing position since he was the one holding the weapon at his brother's throat and that killing everyone should be the only objective anyway. 
Russ might be very well holding the proverbial gun to his temple, but it was only worth anything if he was willing to pull the trigger. Which at that point Russ wasn't, so Angren completely ignored him. Yet, surprisingly, Angren did not press his attack either and both Primarchs separated and went their own way. But, as time would show, the nails had a degrading effect on Angren's ability to hold back and remain coherent, so maybe that's your answer right there. Angren was certain of his victory that day and didn't give the incident any more thought, the nails stayed with him and his legion. In the end, though, Lemon Russ was right, Angren's failure to learn and control his murderous rage would be amply demonstrated and only become worse with time. At the tail end of the Great Crusade when he butchered a whole city which had just surrendered, on Istvan III when he sabotaged Horus clean exterminatus by going down to rip the loyalists apart personally, and on Nuceria where he ordered every living being killed. But what's truly sad is that Logger actually did seemingly succeed where Russ had failed in teaching the lesson of the Night of the Wolf years later. Weirdly, he did this by simply telling Angren in no uncertain terms that Russ had won and why, and for whatever reason Angren's previous retardation dawned on him this time. In the case of Logger's explanation, not being in the middle of a fight to the death, at least as far as Agron was concerned, probably helped with regard to Angren's perceptiveness. Fewer murder murder kill kill impulses from the nails. Additionally, on their way to New Syria during Angren's last weeks as a human, he actually seemed to be trying to open himself up a little more to his legion by joining them in watching pit fights and hanging out with them during feasts. All of which was rendered too little too late by what went down when they reached their destination. Horus Heresy. When Horus decided to rebel, Angren was one of the initial Primarchs to join him, along with Fulgrim and Mortarian. Why is not particularly hard to guess, he already hated the Emperor's guts like practically no other Primarch, with the possible exception of Kurs, and considered the Crusade to be little better than a galaxy spanning slavery endeavor. How this concern jives with him being one of the crusade's most prominent butchers is somewhat strange but his brain probably resembled a scrambled egg more than anything else at this point. On that note, Angren kicked off his contribution to the heresy in a characteristically retarded fashion. When the firestorm on Eistvan died down, it became apparent that large numbers of loyalists had survived. Said survivors immediately hit the Vox casters and began demanding answers hurling insults up at the orbiting fleet outraged and grief-stricken that they had been betrayed by their own Primarchs. Hearing the howled insults of his own loyalist world eaters, which more than likely included some cutting one-liners and yo dead gladiator crude jokes, Angren flew into a rage and deployed onto the planet with his legion. This decision ended up being one of the biggest mistakes of the heresy, as the traitors ended up losing nearly half of their attacking force over a period of three months rather than the clean virus bombing Horus had originally intended. In fact, Horus was so furious that he considered going ahead with the virus bombing even with Angren being down there. However the War Master took a few moments to collect himself and then attempted to salvage the situation. If he backed Angren's ground assault, his troops would get some experience fighting other astarts, and Angren would see that Horus was willing to give him freedoms that the Emperor had not. Sadly for Horus, the situation still turned out to be an apocalyptic clusterfuck. To add insult to injury, Horus eventually decided that he was losing too many assets trying to break the loyalists on the ground. So he had Angren physically wrestled back up into orbit, as Angren wouldn't leave any other way, and used his fleet to glass the entire planet's surface. He was much handier on Istvan V, wreaking all sorts of carnage in the drop site massacre. Ironically his presence there hardly mattered considering how thoroughly boned the loyalists had been to begin with, but having one more supremely capable beat stick to hit one's foes with is always nice. He stayed behind to hunt down the surviving raven guard who'd escaped with their primarch, and would have massacred them if not for their reserves rocking up from deliverance. Lorga then roped Angren into his shadow crusade, systematically butchering worlds across Ultrama to invoke the rune storm. Initially, this was a campaign with mixed success, the two legions nearly fought in the void before an elder fleet tried to destroy Angron, and the world eaters wiped out several worlds which Logger had wanted to skip. The word bearers were nearly driven to despair by the world eaters degradation, and Logger began to worry that Angron couldn't see how he was degenerating, and there was only one way that could end. Still, 
Lorga wanted to save Angron, although in his case save meant transfigure into a demon Primarch. Angron was, according to Horus and Lorga, the only Primarch beside Horus himself that would be able to successfully take on Sanguinius in full rage mode, which at that point was basically the only use Horus had for him. To do that, Lorga led Angron back to his shitty home planet Nuceria where Angron went into a deep depression after witnessing the tragic aftermath of his rebellion. And that lasted until he had the misfortune to be told he had fled that final battle, which made him go completely berserk, ordering his legion to slaughter every fucking thing on the planet faster than an inquisitorial cyclonic torpedo bombardment. The arrival of Gilliman's forces delayed its inevitable doom for a little while, and Anglin had an epic showdown with Robout Gilliman when he helped Lorger in fighting Big Boy Blue. Gilliman called Angron out to which the Red Angel replied as follows. What would you know of struggle, perfect son? When have you fought against the mutilation of your mind? When have you had to do anything more than tally compliances and polish your armor? Dot. Comma the people of your world named you Great One. The people of mine called me slave. Which one of us landed on a paradise of civilization to be raised by a foster father, Robout? Which one of us was given armies to lead after training in the halls of the McCragjan High Riders? Which one of us inherited a strong, cultured kingdom? And which one of us had to rise up against a kingdom with nothing but a horde of starving slaves? Which one of us was a child enslaved on a world of monsters, with his brain cut up by carving knives? Listen to your blue clad wretches yelling of courage and honor, courage and honor, courage and honor. Do you even know the meaning of those words? Courage is fighting the kingdom which enslaves you, no matter that their armies outnumber yours by 10,000 to 1. You know nothing of courage. Honor is resisting a tyrant when all others suckle and grow fat on the hypocrisy he feeds them. You know nothing of honor. Gilliman ended up getting beaten so badly he had to crawl away on hands and knees, though to be fair to him he put up one hell of a fight, especially considering that half his face was missing, but not before throwing back. You're still a slave, Angron. Enslaved by your past, blind to the future. Too hateful to learn. Too spiteful to prosper. The irony is Angron was right all along about Emperor being a dick, as Robout realized on Terra 10,000 years later. But in all seriousness, both of them had a point. Gilliman had it comparatively easy and could have turned out massively different had his life not been so cushy, while Angron's rage over his admittedly shitty life had consumed his soul and didn't exactly let him off the hook for turning his entire legion into murder machines. Additionally, Angron of all people attempting to lecture anyone about the concept of honor is hypocrisy of the highest form. Even Conrad Kurz, arguably the most terrifyingly barbaric Primarch, had a logical reason behind his brutality before he completely lost his mind. Angron never had a reason for killing, and he never needed one. He spilled blood just for the sake of it, annihilating entire planetary systems simply for the lulls. Whatever honor Angron once might have had, he had tossed it aside long ago in the name of satiating his hatred. At the time of his confrontation with Gilliman, he was little more than a rabid dog, his brains in the final stages of degradation via the nails. What made it worse was that the nails themselves, as it turned out, could actually be overcome. As demonstrated by Arian Zorzi, a renegade wee apothecary who threw his lot in with Fabius Bile and eventually became his second in command of the consortium, and who likes evil gardening, a highly disciplined mind could control the aggression of the nails. Which meant that, in yet another tragic twist of irony, Angron might have been able to save himself if he had simply not given over so completely to despair and spite. On the other hand, the cruder copy implanted in World Eater's legionnaires might be easier to overcome than the genuine article, and Zorzi is, so far, a unique case. Furthermore, during their duel Gilliman shattered one of the skulls that Angron had carried on him, which were the remains of the rebels Angron had carried with him and whom he had promised to die alongside with. Until the Emperor abducted him. Angron himself said to Lorger and Betraya that he died on Nuceria, which obviously drove Angron to an entire new level of despair, allowing for Lorger to capitalize on that emotion to fuel Angron's ascension into a demon Primarch. There were even 19 World Eater librarians that had tried to prevent their Primarch's ascension forming a Gestalt Warhound, 
pulling Angren's soul from one end, while Logger as well as some demons pulled at it from the other, like children fighting over a doll. In the end, Logger, being the more powerful Sicker, defeated the librarians, and turned Angren into the demon Primarch we all know and love. Gilliman ended up suffering a grievous wound, but escaped the planet, which was rendered devoid of all life by the World Eaters, and had its records erased by the Imperium of Man. It should also be noted that one or two battles beforehand the Warhound Scout Titan tried to step on Logger after the Aurelian had taken two discharges of the, the Titan's main plasma weapon and was badly hurt, to the point of almost being mortally wounded, in the process. Angren stepped in to save his brother, catching the Titan's foot and setting a new world record in squat weightlifting, keeping the Titan's weight suspended above himself through his sheer strength and rage, enabling Logger, who was almost dead at this point, to escape, meanwhile Ferris Manus could punch through Reva Titans. And this was after digging his way up through 200 plus feet of solid debris, after being warned by we librarians he had been digging downwards, and with Logger teleporting from orbit to help excavating the 11th Primarch, while Logger simultaneously destroyed several ultramarine thunderhawks with telekinetically hurled building debris which Englund had been buried under. Of course, after this the relationship between the two Primarchs became pretty remarkable, and Logger ended up repaying the favor by arranging for Anglin's ascension to demonhood during their fight with Gilliman. At first Logger thought that Gilliman was ruining the song and finally understood that Gilliman had never hated or looked down on him until the heresy, and the destruction of Kalth, actually distracting Logger for a moment as he realized that he had misunderstood his brother all along. At the end though, when Gilliman was about to gain the upper hand Anglin emerged and engaged the Zai Primarch. At this very moment, topped off by Gilliman stepping on one of the aforementioned skulls, the song fell back in tune, and Lorga could finish the incantation. After this, the World Eaters somehow managed to get Angren back aboard his flagship, but were at a bit of a loss as to what to do with him afterwards. Obviously having a blood crazed demon Primarch living in the basement was not exactly ideal even for the world eaters. So initially they attempted to restrain Angron, but there was literally nothing they could do to keep him contained. Any cell block or restraining device they used on him he turned to scrap immediately whenever he got annoyed with it. And yet, Angron never once actually attempted to leave the part of the ship in which he made his lair. He had developed crippling bipolar tendencies, and where his manic phase embodied the champion of raw murder we all know and love, his depressive phase was so utterly dead inside it makes Isha look cheery in comparison. He spent most of his free time cowering in a corner, calling out for the emperor or just crying himself to sleep. This only made the world eaters more terrified of him, as he could rampage through the ship at a moment's notice and they wouldn't be able to stop him. Only Khan was able, or willing, to talk to Angron and even Khan knew he was risking death each time he did so, it would literally only depend on whether or not he caught Angren in a bad mood. Khan's conversations with Angren revealed yet another sad development for the Primarch, which was that becoming a demon had caused him to develop a sort of dementia. He had to be verbally prodded by Khan to remember certain places, people, and events, and Khan was not always successful in doing so. Even his past as a gladiator or his adoptive father were hit or miss in terms of whether or not he could recall them. His entire sense of self had become lost to corn, and he swung from sapient being to bloodthirsty beast with seemingly no control over who he was at any given moment. He also became completely dependent on bloodshed to maintain his link to the mortal realm, and could only last a few weeks without planetary scale butchery to keep him tethered. As such, the world eaters were forced to divert into any populated system they could find as they traveled towards Terra just to keep Englund in the material plane. He was also the only demon Primarch who, in yet another grim irony, never got any say in becoming a demon. So he went from being a slave to the New Syrians, to being a slave to the Emperor, to being a slave to Khorne, forced to fight for all three without ever having any choice. He's basically 40k's butt monkey at this point. Anglin's transformation into a demon also caused the world eaters to develop an unmatched hatred for the word bearers for so thoroughly destroying their gen father. Khan in particular was furious about this, as being the only person who Angren wouldn't immediately kill gave him front row seat to witness the completely broken, miserable monster Anglin had ultimately become. Shortly thereafter, 
Horus sent Perchurabo to go collect Angren and his now completely degenerated legion fuse at the Siege of Terror. As stated previously, the World Eaters had needed to stop every time they found a populated system in order to shed the blood necessary to keep Angren in the material realm. But they were getting too sidetracked in doing so, and Horus hadn't been able to talk them into hurrying up. Upon confronting the World Eaters, the Iron Warriors absolutely wrecked their maniacal brothers, ironically by doing the same sort of thing that the Space Wolves had so many years ago during the Night of the Wolf. Instead of allowing the World Eaters to engage them in close combat, the Iron Warriors initially shot only the demons amongst the World Eaters, and then largely attempted to trap or disable the World Eaters where possible. The point was both to deny them combat, and thus power, and obviously to round them up for the siege. Angren himself confronted Perchurabo, and as with their respective legionnaires, Perch shoved Angren's shit in by simply having a brain. After getting blasted into pasta sauce by a group of iron warriors, Angren jumped into melee with Perchurabo and heavily damaged his armor. Perchurabo got in a decent counter hit or two, but even with Forgebreaker in hand, he was ultimately no match for Angren in melee combat. However, Perchurabo had one weapon that Angren did not, the power of spiteful mockery, seems to be something of a weakness amongst the demon primarchs. Mortorian got the same treatment later from the Khan, and Fulgrim from Rylana. He repeatedly insulted Angren as being a weak, pitiful slave who had sold his strength out of despair, and had become weaker as a result. Of course, Angren hadn't actually chosen to become a demon at all, but Perchurabo clearly either didn't know or didn't care. The lack of slaughter, and possibly the insults, drained Angren of much of his power. Perturabo, despite his armor having been badly mangled, had taken only superficial damage from Angren's assault, and he pressed his attack. The iron circle surround the two of them, and Angren attempted a few times to attack the automata. However their shields held, and Perturabo opened fire with a multitude of weapons built into his armor, more than a few of which fired rounds that were implied to be anti-demon in nature. The very first obliterator, Volk, then added a fusillade of his own to the mix. The assault of Perturabo and Volk, combined with the Iron Warriors having denied the World Eaters their tithe of blood, weakened Angren to the point where he could no longer fight. Perturabo took the opportunity to mock Angren a bit more, and then waltzed over to him and unceremoniously knocked him out with a single blow from Forgebreaker. After this, he collected his recalcitrant brother and his legion and packed them up to head for terror. The fact Perchurabo accomplished all this while sustaining minimal casualties shows how impressive his track record during the Great Crusade could have been if he actually gave a damn. 41st Millennium. Anglin has done far more shit than all the other demon primarchs put together. Instead of sitting around being a painting on some chaos god's wall, sitting around while being a rotting fattus and feeling sorry for themselves, sitting around and yelling just as planned and a time anything happens, sitting around and preaching constantly, being, maybe, dead, or being missing, Angren actually gets shit done and boy howdy when he rages his way out of the eye of terror he makes sure that everyone knows about it. By tearing everything that gets in his way a new one until he finally gets thrown back into the warp by drowning in a quadrillion metric fucktons of imperial guardsmen, planetary defense force soldiers, space marines, witch hunters, bolter bitches, titans, inquisitorial stormtroopers, demon hunters, and grey knights, but to be fair, everyone kind of does it when the Imperium finishes the paperwork needed to retaliate. This was of course before the gathering storm, whereupon Magnus personally attacked Fenris and laid waste to much of the planet and destroyed a lot of gene seed, proving that Siege can get shit done too. Then in 8th edition Mortarian waged plague wars against Ultramar and established the Scourge Stars systems in M42. Also it should be noted that Fulgrim has been free of that painting for a while now, but otherwise he still fits in the above category. He also slaughtered his way throughout Imperial space for over a century with 50,000 world eater berserkers and destroyed maimed killed burned broke the backs of split open fucked 70 sectors. However, in a subsequent Imperial offensive, Anglin was banished to the warp and his men routed. This strike force comprised two titan legions, only four full space marine chapters and over 30 imperial guard regiments to do that, so it suffice to say that the counter attack put up quite a fight against the superior force. 
But to be fair, Angren's force was only comprised of close combat heavy infantry without range support or artillery. Later on, he showed up with an even bigger force to attack Armageddon. The Imperium responded in kind, sending in 100 Grey Knight Terminators, and all but 10 of them died fighting Angren and his bloodthirster posse, and only because their prodigy librarian Hyperion managed to shatter his sword, and he still managed to murder their leader with just his bare fists. He is armed with a really huge fucking chain axe that's taller than him with chain swords for the chain teeth of the chain axe. He's also got a storm bolter, but we wouldn't be surprised if that fired chain swords as well. Fittingly enough, it was called Godzilla. Strangely, as seen in the picture above, he also still has the butcher's nails stuck in his head. This should be completely impossible as Angren technically speaking doesn't have a body anymore, he's 100% warp energy now and the nails are technological in nature. He's also been blasted into paste on numerous occasions and forcibly dematerialized into the warp on a number of others, which means that the nails seemingly regenerate along with the rest of him. The most likely explanation is that, as a demon, he is at least partially shaped by the mortal perception of him, and the nails are a big part of his story to anyone with high enough clearance to know his name. If that is true, then he actually is finally free of the nails and the wires and bits poking out of his skull are just his way of making sure no one confuses him with Doombreed or something. He also wrote something called a clotted scroll somewhere along the line, though precisely what wisdom he wrote, probably in blood, and there is unknown, maybe methods on how to rip and tear more effectively? Dot. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.